I work inside a company called Fjord. Fjord was started in London in 2001. Uh, we are the service design uh, consultancy within Accenture. We're actually part of Accenture Interactive. And um, so we've been going for some time now. And um, we're now, Accenture acquired us two years ago. We're now over 500 designers across the world. We're in 15 cities. Um, and we've been thinking a lot over the last couple of years about what happens next. And our proposition is that uh, we're on, on the edge now. In fact, it's already happening of something we call living services, which is the third wave of the internet. And what I'm going to try and do in the next 20 minutes is to frame for you what we think is about to happen and the impact it's going to have on, on all of our clients and, and everyone in this room. There are two things happening which are really driving living services. The first is the digitalization of everything. We're going to hear from Hilton later on, and I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say because what Hilton are doing, and other hotel chains as well, is that they're putting, they're putting sensors inside their doors and their rooms. Now, that's very significant, not because the door becomes clever. Let's face it, it doesn't become that clever. It's still a pretty dumb object. But suddenly, for hundreds of thousands of travelers all over the world in the next couple of years, they're going to experience something which was previously very stupid becoming just a little bit cleverer. And as they do that, and as they connect with the fact that their car is becoming connected and their home is becoming connected, they'll begin to realize that this invisible layer of the internet is permeating absolutely everything. So the digitization of everything, and I think Hotel Doors is an interesting moment, is happening right now. The second thing that is happening is what we call liquid expectations. So liquid expectations basically means this. The first time you step out of a Halo cab or an Uber cab, uh, and you walk away without paying because actually the payment all happens in the cloud, particularly good experience in London in the middle of the winter where you don't have to fiddle in your pockets and get wet and cold while you're waiting for the receipt and all the rest of that. The first time you do that is very significant. And all of a sudden you begin to think, why doesn't, why doesn't all payments work like that? Why can't all the experiences I have around transactions work like this? That's so simple. That is a liquid experience. Suddenly, something which has been invented over here for chauffeur driven cars affects something which happens over here. So we're no longer in our industries competing with our direct competitors. We're now actually competing with our experiential competitors because we have these liquid expectations. Five months ago, <clears throat> BMW dealer took my car to, sent me um, a video in the middle of the morning. So normally when I go to a car dealer, everything goes tits up, 4.30 in the afternoon, they phone you and they tell you your car's in a mess. Uh, we can't get the spare part, and it's not going to be ready for a week, and by the way, it's going to cost you 500 pounds, and you don't really understand what they're saying. Instead, 11 o'clock in the morning, I'd left it there at 7, I got a video selfie of an engineer and my car up on the ramp, and he walked around the car for two minutes, and he told me what was wrong with it. Brilliant customer service. Do my bank do this? No. Do my telco do this? No, they don't. Do British Airways do this for me? Not yet. So. This is another example of a liquid experience. I got something, I now expect all my customer service to look and feel like that, but it doesn't, and the others are going to have to catch up. So these are two very dramatic forces which are driving this, and we see this thing as being very much what we call the third, the third wave. So the first wave was desktop web, the second wave was mobility, and please don't misunderstand from this chart that I'm trying to suggest that mobility era is over. It's not. We're still in the middle of it. We've seen stuff this morning which suggests there's still a very long way to go in understanding how mobile works, not just for advertising, but for the delivery of all services. But the third one is happening now. And the real impact of living services is that it's building on top of the other two. And the implication of that is that it gets more complicated. A few years ago, designers were really only thinking about, or digital designers were designing for screens this big with a simple interaction paradigm of a keyboard and a mouse. Then along came smartphones, and they're having to think about touch and swipe and various other things like that. Now we have living services, and we're having to think about voice, gesture, location. All of these things become part of the interaction paradigm. So complexity inexorably is going up. What I'm trying to suggest is that our lives are going to become more complicated, more difficult as professionals servicing clients or as clients as this complexity rises. So we're in for an interesting, fascinating, and at times rough ride as we try to deal with this complexity. So why do we call this living? We call it living for three reasons. The first is, and this is in some ways the one which I still find hardest to grasp, these services are going to change in real time around us. So they're going to respond to contextual data to change the very fabric of the services that we are being delivered. I'm not talking about marketing now. I'm talking about services. They will change the fabric of those services in real time as they arrive. And, and in five years' time, we will look back at the desktop web 
and it will look, even what we have now, extremely antiquated as a result of this. The second reason we call it living is because they will be very proximate to us through wearables and nearables. So it will be embedded in the fabric of our lives, our homes, our cars, our work, etc. And the third reason we call it living is because we think these things are going to have a fundamental impact on the way we lead our lives. They will change the shape of our lives more than everything we've seen in the first 20 years of the internet. They're going to hit uh, many things which are actually deeply emotionally important to us. Our health, our education, our children, our homes, our work. So how will they change our lives? So I'm going to summarize this. I, I should say, by the way, I'm going to move very fast through this because there is a lot to say in a short space of time. There is plenty of information on this, which I believe our, our hosts are going to send out um, after. There's a link to a, to a website where we explain a lot more. There's a PDF you can download, which is about 100 pages and has a great deal of detail on this. I'm really just trying to do a quick summary now. So the summary of this slide is easy. This is happening. Th this will change our lives in a very large number of generally very small ways. Of course, there are some things like driverless cars which are going to change our lives in big ways. But most of the things that happen will be about small accretions of little changes, like getting out of the cab and not having to pay, like not having to think about the temperature and air conditioning in your home because there's a clever thermostat managing it, like not having to think about a whole number of things. In fact, a client I was talking to recently, very cleverly, I, I was explaining this, and he turned around and he said, what you're talking about is taking things off the thinking list. I thought it was a fantastic quote, because that is exactly what we're talking about. And taking things off the thinking list, if you do a lot of that, turns out to actually be quite a big change in the way we lead our lives. So again, the paradox here is this is dramatic, but it's about a series of small things adding up to a big dramatic change in our lives. And it's going to take place in a whole number of different areas. Time doesn't permit to go through each one of these. I mentioned the PDF earlier, there's a lot more data. What we've done is we've created a lot of evidence for where we already see the outliers on this happening and where the change is happening. And then we have predicted some of the things that we think are going to happen. I would just single out one of these, which is the home. So I think in particular the home is going to be a gigantic battleground between some very obvious candidates. I think what, um, what Amazon have been doing recently is especially interesting and clearly, you know, this is me saying this, not Google. They're squaring up, I think, very, very clearly to compete with Google and Apple. They have HomeKit. Uh, and I, you know, one would guess that Facebook will try and get in there as well. But if you look at what Amazon is doing with Amazon Echo and now Amazon Buttons, how many people are aware of Amazon Buttons? So quite a few. So Amazon Buttons, if you're not aware, are basically branded buttons which you put in the house and you just press the button when you want replenishment of a particular good. Think washing liquid. So I'd put my Amazon button next to the washing machine because that's the place where I know I want to know when I want to replace it. Think nappies. You know, these are not very interesting goods. They're of low mental interest, but running out of them is very painful. So what they're doing is through these buttons, which I think is an interim technology in the Internet of Things, I think it'll get cleverer, they're just taking something off the thinking list. So why is this happening now? Again, in a word, this is really about price. Uh, what has happened is that a large number of technologies have become affordable, sensors in particular, uh, not quite cheap as chips, but, but pretty much there, and being embedded in everything, which is why the hotel chains are doing it now, because the price, you know, a lot of this technology has been there for a while. None of this should be a surprise to anyone. What's interesting is that the price level and the fact that we've generally got pretty ubiquitous good connectivity, not all the time where I live in Sussex, sadly, but most of the time we have good connectivity. That's all coming together in the same space in order to enable this. So what does this mean for business? So the first one is you've got to know your customer, and we've heard quite a lot about that already this morning, particularly with some of the stuff on programmatic marketing. Think of this, if you like, as being programmatic services. That's the best analogy, if you like, that I can, I can immediately think of. And, and, and when we say know your customer, what we mean is really understand your customer at a deep level, but in a particular niche. You can't know everything. I'll come back to that point in a moment. The second thing that you need to be able to do is flex your technology. So if you do not have, and, and trust me, most of our clients do not yet have this, a platform which is flexible enough to move into new unexpected places, then you will not be able to win in this game. So you have to know the customer. You have to be able to flex your platform. But the third one, those two are easy to say. The third one is you need to be able to design in order to know and flex. And you might look at me and say, yeah, well, you would talk about design because you're in the design business. I actually mean design in a very broad sense here. 
And what I mean is, it is impossible to know everything. If you believe in him, only God knows everything. So we can't know everything. And that means that organizations need to make, take a long, hard look at what they want to know in order to deliver living services and then focus ruthlessly on knowing that better than any of their competition or even their experiential competition that I mentioned earlier on. And then they need to think long and hard about how they're going to design their system in order to deliver on this. Because anything other than a focus on knowing and flexing and designing exactly what you're going to do and being clear on that strategy for this age of living services, you will be an also ran. And that is because, and this is almost goes without saying, this is really about designing around individuals. So we've heard about one-to-one -one marketing. I mean, one-to-one -one marketing has been around since as long as I've been, been working. You know, but it's not really been delivered on that well, let's face it. Now we're talking about one-to-one -one services, and these are going to be delivered over the next few years. So how is this going to happen? I think if I had to single out one thing, and again, I've truncated some of what we would say in a longer session, is that businesses are going to have to think about what we call living operations. And, and this is probably the single biggest and most important message for, for, big, for big and small organizations, is that if you cannot flex around the customer in real time, then you are not going to be able to deliver living services and you will fall behind. And that then means that you need to create an operational structure which is no longer silo-based, no longer ruthlessly focused on efficiency, which is still, particularly after the financial crisis where a lot of clients are focused at the moment, but actually focus on flexibility. I'll put a bet now that those organizations that focus on flexibility rather than efficiency, they will be the winners. Hard message for a CFO, I know that, but this is a way in which we're going to tackle this era is by creating operational flexibility. That also probably means quite small units who are all moving in the same direction towards the same goal, but are given a lot of operational autonomy. Again, this is quite a difficult message for quite a lot of large organizations. In fact, there's a metaphor for this, which one of my colleagues, uh, Luis Villar in Madrid, came up with, which I just loved. He said, you know, the metaphor to ask clients is, where, where do you think you are as a physical state at the moment? So are you a solid? So if you're a solid, you're not ready for living services. And note this word here, by the way, volatility. This is a word which not a lot of clients like, but actually there's some, you know, there's some truth behind this. The more volatile you are, the more ready you are for this. And, and solids only change when, when earthquakes happen. So the tectonic plates move, everything gets very painful very quickly. So you could be liquid. So media has suffered a lot from digital. So they've become more liquid over the last 20 years. We know that. The problem with liquid is it only tends to flow through preordained grooves or channels. We call them valleys. Uh, or streams or rivers. Um, and it takes a long time for liquid to carve out its new grooves. So a better state to be in, and the one we think clients should be aiming for, is gas. So this is where you can flow into unexpected nooks and crannies. I talked earlier about no. I talked earlier, you know, you understand where the nook and cranny is. You flex, your platform is able to deliver on it, and bang, you're able to deliver a service suddenly into a new space where it didn't exist before and capture the customer at that moment. This has got to be the aim for most people. Actually, when Luis was talking this through with a colleague of his, uh, the colleague said, you know there is a state beyond gas? Luis didn't know this. He said, what's the state? He said, it's plasma. And the interesting thing about plasma is it conducts electricity uh, and, and energy can flow through it. So if you really want to go out there, then plasma is probably the place to go. And there may be only three or four companies in the world who are in that space right now, and genuinely. So what does this mean for brands? I think. In a word, it means brands are going to have to atomize. So all products and services are going to have to think long and hard about that atomize so they can flow through the Internet of Things and deliver their services seamlessly, whether it's on one of these, or whether it's in an Uber cab, or whether it's in an airplane, or whether it's in a connected car, or whether it's through an Amazon device in the home, or whether it's through any device in the home for that matter. This proliferation of places where services can be delivered is going to be very confusing. If you want to deliver to the customer at the right time and the right place, you actually have to think about atomizing your services to flow through them. It may surprise a lot of people, but we're seeing banks thinking about this very, very hard. Banks are beginning to atomize their products and services to flow through and become more like gas. I think they're actually some distance ahead of the curve for, for most organizations right now. Um, and, and that then delivers, if you like, this concept of living brands. So living brands are brands that change in real time. It will no longer be possible for the CMO to have a brand guideline book or even a brand guideline website that says this is how the brand is always represented because brands can't work like that anymore. Think about the way Spotify morphs, changes and, uh, around every single medium it goes through. 
Uh, I get Spotify through Sonos, I get it through my phone, uh, I could get it in my car if I had a Ford motor vehicle. It's changing in all of those. In all of them, it's having to adapt its brand around the environment in order to deliver specifically the service. And they're still in early days. I still think they could get a lot better at what they do. That's what I call a living brand. So I need to finish with the impact on design. In fact, I need to finish overall. Um, so again, there's a lot to say on the impact on design. And I could talk um, if you would let me. And thankfully, you're not going to let me. Um, for hours about the impact this will have. One of my colleagues calls it zero UI uh, on um, interface design, on gestures, uh, on voice. We will be designing, we are beginning to design for these things a lot right now, and, and it's extremely challenging. In some cases, the interface disappears altogether, and that also is a significant design and service delivery challenge. But I wanted to end on, on, on two things with the design challenge, and that comes back to data. Again, we've you know, it's inexorably, we're talking about data and the impact of data on services. And there are two things that we need to think about with design. The first is, how do you design using data? So what data do you use in order to, 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 to develop a new design? I'm not talking about information graphics. Those have been around for a long time, since uh, John Snow, not very far from here, uh, used information graphics to detect the source of cholera and then began to solve the problem of cholera. If you haven't seen the map, it's a beautiful map. Look it up on the web. Um, and Florence Nightingale used information graphics. Not many people know, but she did. She was extremely good at it. Information design has been around for a long time. This is about actually using data to inform the shape of the services that are delivered. But secondly, and just as importantly, it is about using data. It is about designing to grab data. So it is about designing the services so that you elicit data from the customer, from their context and everything they're doing, which then goes back into the system and in real time, changes the living service that you are delivering. That is, a, again, I talk about this, if it sounds glib, I certainly don't mean it to, this is an enormous design challenge. And that's why we're talking about it now, because we believe this is a, a challenge that all clients, uh, all agencies, and all designers will be having to grapple with and need to begin to grapple with now. I think that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>